This is the lecture for European history for Friday, the 1st of October, 2021. Number one, make sure that during school hours you sign in as attending class virtually online using the same system we used last year. Number two, make sure that you see this entire video. Number three, make sure that after seeing this entire video, you make a thoughtful and intelligent comment about it in the comments below where the video link is on the Google stream. So having said all of that, the content, the comments should be in by no later than 3 p.m. tomorrow or today, uh, which is Friday, October 1st, uh, 2021. So get all your comments in before 3 p.m. and make sure that you see the entire thing before you do. We've already talked about, and I sent an email out about the nature of the comments that you can use. We had been talking about geography, which you are expected to remember, and uh, the key figures, and we went through the first four. John Wycliffe, Leonardo Bruni, Marsilio Ficino, and Johannes Gutenberg. And I'm using the unusual technique of basically giving you this study sheet with the specific definitions so that you know who these men are, and, or, and women, there are a few women, and um, what they did that's of historical significance that you are going to be expected to remember in a quiz sometime next week, not Monday. Not Monday. So we start with the painter, number five. And you should have your notes out and be following along. Number five, Paolo Uccello. Paolo Uccello is an Italian painter and mathematician who was notice, notable for his pioneering work on visual perspective in art. Now, we also have Masaccio, who is a painter of the Italian Renaissance, who is known for his skill at recreating lifelike figures and movements, as well as, as a convincing sense of three dimensions. Now, what this involves is perspective. Both Uccello and Masaccio play with perspective. In the Middle Ages, as in ancient Egypt, the perspective of pictures tends to be flat. And so you end up with people in these odd positions in two-dimensional form. Look, think about the Bayou Tapestry and the, the, the Norman Knights of William the Conqueror fighting the Saxons under King uh, Harold Godwinson. And it's cartoonish. And everything seems to be happening at about the same distance. Well, what Uccello and Masaccio come up with is a different way of looking at perspective. So here we have the perspective point. And sometimes there is more than one perspective point. Now, with that perspective point is the is it is the focal point of the entire painting. So now I'm going to try to get closer so that we can all see what I'm talking about with the drawing up here. Will this work? It might. There, you got a good look at my belly. So here is the perspective point. And now what we're going to do is uh, we are going to draw a city street stream, street scene. And so what we're going to have is some buildings in the distance. Get a building a little closer. And you've got nearer buildings. Buildings nearer by. And no, nope, it's got to be a steeper angle. So this building is closer by. And it's even got a steeper angle. And there's the edge of your painting. And here on this side, let's say this building is joined by a colonnade. And in that colonnade, you've got a bunch of arches. And these arches are made more three-dimensional by doing things like that. You've got little entryways into the arches. And there is a wall back here. There's sort of wall over here. And that wall has a door in it. 
And what you will notice, we've got some windows here, some happy little trees over there. Here we've got a door, door, and some windows on the second floor, some nice big ones. And here we've got a first floor window, door, close enough so we can see the door there. Let's say there's a hint of a doorknob there. We've got another window right here, and you've got some second floor windows. And I hope that it's obvious that what you're seeing is that all the lines tend to converge on that perspective point. Um, say we have in the distance uh, some kind of church. So got a chance, a lousy cross, but there we go. Sort of comes down like this. Church has an interesting roof. It goes over here. Got a rose window of some kind and some stained glass. Make that perfect. You've got the doors here. And in the distance, you've got some hills and some farm fields and some birds. Why not? But everything in the painting is converging to some extent or other on this point of perspective. And in doing that, what the painting is, is, is achieving is a sense of three-dimensionality. Now, uh, after a while, you do not only have one perspective point, because most people, other than me, are binocular. You'd have two perspective points, and so you would have uh, various things fading into both. But this method can convey a sense of three-dimensionality uh, to people. So uh, Uccello and Masaccio do that. I think we'll keep, stay a little closer than usual and maybe even avoid that ceiling light being in the frame all the time. So, Uccello pioneers work on visual perspective in art. Masaccio has more lifelike figures and also uh, does some convincing uh, perspective uh, work in his paintings, uh, conveying three-dimensionality. Baldassare Castiglione. Baldassare Castiglione, figure number seven, an Italian courtier, that is a person who works in a royal court as an assistant to the ruler, as somebody who uh, is not a body servant, somebody who doesn't dress the, uh, the king, uh, but somebody who serves the king in, a, like, uh, in, a, in, a, in an official capacity as a secretary or as something like that. So, Baldassare Castiglione, Castiglione is a courtier, a diplomat, a soldier, and a prominent Renaissance author, most famous for writing the book of the courtier, which is a book about being a courtier and about how to be a courtier. And so we have a sense from him of what politics is, is, is like and how it's changing and all of that. Then we have Vittorino da Feltri, Vittorino da Feltri. Uh, an Italian humanist and teacher who set up a school at Mantua where he taught not only the Marquis of Mantua's children, and the Marquis's uh, family of Mantua is going to be important as we do Isabella d'Este later. Um, Isabella d'Este. Uh, so, De Feltri has a school in Mantua where the Marquis, that's the ruler of Mantua's children, go together with many poor children, treating them on an equal basis. He taught the humanistic subjects, but emphasized both religious and physical education. Now, I used to work in the early to mid-90s for a social service agency in Portland, Maine. And this agency started out as a school for children from a certain neighborhood, especially students with deep and profound special needs. But this neighborhood also had parents of children who were basically normally abled, 
to be willing to send their normal children to a school with profoundly disabled children, both mentally and physically. And this was a preschool and kindergarten and lower grade elementary. And the school lasted uh, for many, many years. It lasted for, I think, over 20 years. So the preschool program continued through my time there. It may still exist. And what it is is one of these remarkable programs where you have uh, children from rich families and poor families, children who are perfectly able and children who are deeply disabled, all in a similar environment, in the same environment, working together, playing together, getting what they can out of relating to one another. That's a difficult thing for a school to do. First of all, it's difficult to get parents of normal children willing to send their children to a school with people with deep and profound special needs. It is also really uh, difficult to create a program of study and fun that is going to suit the needs, the special needs of some of the people involved, and that is going to also uh, suit the general needs of an average kid of that age. The Feltry pulls it off. His school at Mantua is, well, it's still being talked about to this day. Next page. Lorenzo il Magnifico de Medici. Lorenzo the Magnificent of the House of Medici. And Lorenzo is the archetypical patron of the arts, the archetypical Renaissance ruler. What I mean by that is, in an almost platonic sense, an ideal Renaissance ruler. Lorenzo and his Medici family bring the arts to the forefront of their civic improvements in Florence. Lorenzo brings Michelangelo Bonarotti into his home as his adopted son. The woman in the movie who loves him was raised as his sister. She wasn't his sister, but they were raised together. So Lorenzo brings in this artistic prodigy to grow up with his kids as a member of his family. He patronizes the arts. And by that, I don't mean, ooh, that's so artistic. No, I mean, he provides money and political support and the opportunity for artists to work. And more than anything, and this is something that we did explore seeing the agony and ecstasy, Art artists need to work. They need to produce. They need to do things that are of interest and value at the peak of their ability. So what it says here is Lorenzo is an Italian statesman and ruler of the Florentine Republic during the high point of the early Renaissance uh, in Italy. His death marked the end of the golden age of Florence. The fragile peace he helped maintain between the various Italian states collapsed with his death. And that brings about a warlike period which Julius II, the Pope, was having to deal with. Um, Petrarch is the father of humanism. That is how he has seen. Petrarch, it says, is an Italian scholar and poet, one of the earliest Renaissance humanists, who is often called the father of humanism. Remember, if humanism is the belief or the, 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 the principle that man is the measure of all things and that the proper study of man is man, a humanist will focus on human factors. For example, one of the things that uh, made uh, Leonardo Bruni's history interesting is that he focused on human factors. So bad, by the way, did Herodotus, uh, not Herodotus, I'm sorry, uh, did Thucydides, the great Greek historian of the Peloponnesian War. Both of them explored human motivation as the cause of history, rather than simply saying, it's God's will. It's God's will may be true if you're a person of faith, but looking at the human causes helps us to understand how the individual relates to society, how government can become either a force for freedom and liberty or a force of oppression and tyranny. Understanding how people approach their self-interest, how people pursue their ambitions, what people are willing and not willing to do in service to those ambitions, whether they be personal within the state or whether they be one country against another. 
human motivations, economic, political, philosophical, sociological, there's a bunch of other fancy words, but basically what it means is you look at people. They may be inspired by God, but you look for human causes to human events. And Petrarch talks a lot about that, the father of humanism. Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci is the ultimate Renaissance man, whereas uh, Lorenzo il Magnifico de' Medici is the ultimate Renaissance ruler. Da Vinci is what's called a polymath. I'll, I'll read the description here and you'll get the idea. An Italian polymath. That means somebody who is incredibly good at almost everything he does. I mean, people like that can be really annoying. But they're also gifts to humanity and human history. Four curses. Leonardo is an Italian. That's what polymath means. Uh, a person who does many things well. He is a painter, a sculptor, an architect, a musician, a scientist, a mathematician, an engineer, an inventor, an anatomist, a geologist, a cartographer, a botanist, and a writer who has often been described as the archetype of the Renaissance man. This guy dug up cadavers and sliced them open to understand human anatomy so that he could paint people better, understand the muscle structure beneath the skin, understand how eyes work, how organs are put together. And he also used that knowledge to posit scientific ideas, ideas about uh, the nature of the human body, the, the, the function of many organs that weren't readily obvious. For example, it's fairly easy for a primitive person or a person without modern technology to understand what the heart does. The ancient Egyptians thought the brain was just waste matter. They didn't take the brain seriously. We understand that the brain is the heart of our mind. It's where the electromagnetic impulses that make our living self more than the sum of its parts. But it's not obvious to somebody who's looking for physical function. Uh, da Vinci paints some truly and draws some truly and invents some truly amazing breakthrough uh, works that we're going to explore next week in detail. So I'm just making reference. Leonardo da Vinci is the leader of the Ninja Turtles, but we are encountering, encountering the other Ninja Turtles as well as we go forward. Now, after Leonardo da Vinci is person number 12, Isabella de Este. Feminists love her because she is, in fact, uh, an effective female ruler. Mar Marchesa of Mantua, that is the uh, Marquis's wife. She is the, like, that's like the queen of Mantua. But a, mar a Marquis or a Margrave is like a count. It's a mid-grade nobility, but the Count of Mantua is the ruler of an independent city-state. So the Margrave of Mantua, and she is the Mrs. Margrave of Mantua. Let's see. Marchesa of Mantua, regent of Mantua during the absence of her husband, Francesco II Gonzaga, Marquess of Mantua, and in the minority of her son, Federico, Duke of Mantua. So he gets promoted to be Duke, which is a higher rank than Marquis. What Isabella de Este does is, in the absence of a husband who is present, who may be actually being held for ransom, and she doesn't want to pay quickly, she rules. She is a ruling female monarch or noblewoman. And while her son is in his minority, that means while her son <coughs> is too young to rule as an independent person, she is his regent. So for a number of years in Italy, you have a female ruler making consistent long-term policy. That's unusual. Niccolo Machiavelli, we have studied uh, a little bit of already. He is the ultimate pragmatic political philosopher, although he did have some idealistic ideas that were simply published elsewhere than The Prince. Machiavelli, it says here, writer of, among other things, The Prince, which advocated a ruthless, amoral, and subtle self-interest as the most rational basis for public policy. The leader wants to be a success. Therefore, the leader is mindful of the psychology, they wouldn't use that term, of the people under him. And that leader is going to use their human nature, his understanding of their human nature, 
their desire for enlightened self-interest. And he's going to manipulate all of that stuff to his advantage. He is going to try to be loved to an extent, but not too much. He's going to be taken seriously. Because on some level, he is not only capable of generosity, but of ruthlessness. If they're smart, they'll fear you. In so many words, that is what you're going for. Not hate, but fear disappointing you. If you can get your people to fear disappointing you more than they're afraid of any enemy or any other factor, you're going to lead them effectively. Whether you lead them to the good or the ill, that's another question. But leadership as a technique is something that Machiavelli has some very interesting things to say, some very modern things to say. Uh, Queen Isabella of Castile, whose marriage united Castile with Aragon to form Spain, who conquered the Moors, who expelled the Jews, and who sent Columbus on his voyage of discovery. So, let's see if we can do this this way. Over here, we have the map of Iberia. Here is Castile. It is the strongest of the Iberian kingdoms. Here is Port Aragon, and here is Portugal. Both Portugal and Aragon down. Uh, it's, it's, I'm doing this backwards, and upside down almost. The leader, uh, the, the the royal families of Aragon and of Portugal both have princes about her age, certainly of marriageable, marriageable age, to Queen Isabella. Castile is the dominant power in Iberia. Aragon has its interests facing east, and it's Aragon that controls Naples and Sicily. Portugal has its interests out in the Atlantic, and Portugal is ultimately going to begin the Age of Discovery. Who does Isabella, Queen of Spain, Queen of Castile, should I say, marry? Well, she almost marries the Prince of Portugal, but ultimately she marries Ferdinand of Aragon. What this does is it creates a unified Hispania, a unified Spain, that both focuses power inward towards the Mediterranean and Italy, Naples and Sicily, that's what they get from Aragon, but also controls the majority of Iberia's wealth, money, population, uh, and power, leaving Portugal somewhat marginalized. And it's Isabella's forces that uses this unified Spanish power, which includes, by the way, the uh, advanced knowledge of the Arabs that, that was taken when Spain was conquered by the Christians. This all comes under Isabella's rule, and she uses it to drive out the Moors, make Spain Christian, and in service to that, drive out the Jews, because with the elimination of the Moors, we have the opportunity to make Spain a purely Catholic Christian kingdom. And so uh, let's send the, give the Jews a choice, convert or leave. Uh, and many chose to leave and many chose to convert. And those who converted were the primary focus of what became known as the Spanish Inquisition. The question is, were those Jews serious in becoming Christian or were they backsliding secretly behind the scenes and perpetuating their Judaism? If that was the case, the second, if they were sneakily Jewish, the Inquisition would persuade them through torture otherwise. So we'll talk more about the Inquisition later. Now, Ferdinand of Aragon, King Ferdinand, is the next person. And what it says about him, her husband, the husband of Isabella, is that he was the ruler of Aragon whose marriage united it with Castile to form Spain who conquered the Moors, who expelled the Jews, and who sent Columbus on his voyage of discovery. But even though the late Middle Ages and Renaissance period was definitely an age of men, was definitely a patriarchy, because Isabella controlled and was the ancestral queen of the most powerful territory in the land, she actually took precedence over her husband in many affairs. If you've read Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings, it's a bit like Celeborn and Galadriel in Lothlorien. Celeborn is the husband of Galadriel. 
But Celeborn is a Sindar elf who never went to see the Undying Lands. Galadriel is a Noldo elf who went to the Undying Lands and came back. So she is, just in the nobility of the elves, far more noble than her husband. As such, even though Celeborn is co-ruler, he is the junior partner. Even though Ferdinand of Aragon is the husband of Isabella, in many political fa uh, aspects, he is the junior partner. It is Isabella who calls the tune. So, again, don't let anyone tell you women have never wielded power in the past, because they have. It's just under certain circumstances. And Isabella is a key figure. Getting rid of the Moors, getting rid of the Jews, and sending Columbus on his way, all three of them changed the world in different ways to different degrees. And Isabella is at the heart of all of that. Now, Julius II, Pope, warrior pontiff who defended papal territories against diverse secular rulers and commissioned Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And we saw Julius portrayed by the English actor Rex Harrison in the movie The Agony and the Ecstasy. Warrior Pope sent Michelangelo to work on the ceiling. That's Those are the big things about him. Giovanni Pico de Mirandola. Giovanni Pico de Mirandola. It's just fun to say. Say it. I mean, you can say it out loud. Surprise your dog or your cat or your parents or your brothers or sisters. Say, Giovanni Pico de Mirandola. It's just fun. Okay, so let's learn about this guy. An Italian Renaissance philosopher who is famed for the events of 1486, when, at the age of 23, he proposed to defend 900 theses on religion, philosophy, natural philosophy, that's science, and magic, people believed in magic back then, against all comers, for which he wrote the famous Oration on the Dignity of Man which is uh, like the manifesto of the Renaissance. As uh, Lorenzo of the Magnificent is the ultimate Renaissance ruler, and Leonardo da Vinci is the ultimate Renaissance man, uh, Pico di Mir della Mirandola, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, writes the oration on the dignity of man, which is like a clarion call to humanism. Michelangelo Bonarotti obviously portrayed by Charlton Heston in the movie The Agony and the Ecstasy. What it says here is Italian Renaissance painter, sculptor, architect, poet, and engineer, sculptor of David, painter of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, and architect of St. Peter's Cathedral's palace and dome. Now, with Michelangelo, we're also going to cover next week a number of his artworks, and we're going to go into much more detail then. <sighs> So we got two of the Ninja Turtles so far. We've got Leonardo. Uh, we've got um, um, up, 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 up. yeah, Leonardo for Leonardo da Vinci. We've got Michelangelo, Michelangelo Bonarotti. Now we have the third uh, of the four Ninja Turtle Turtles, Raphael Sanzio di Urbino. Raphael di Sanzio. I'm sorry, Raphael Sanzio uh, di Urbino. Now, Raphael, as he's known is the Italian painter and architect of the High Renaissance, celebrated for the perfection and grace of his paintings and drawings, famous for his painting, The School of Athens, which is in the barrel vault of a building. It's sort of this flat-bottomed, round-topped picture, and I'll show it to you next week. At least I, I plan to. The fourth of the Ninja Turtles, Donatello, I could have included, I didn't. Uh, so if you feel like it, look up Donatello. Da, 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 da. If you feel like it, look like... If you feel like it, look at Donatello. Jan van Eyck. Jan van Eyck is a Flemish painter from Flanders. It's now part of Belgium. A Flemish painter, that's northern and western Europe, out of Italy. So we're out of Italy again. We started out of, out of Italy with um, um, uh, Wycliffe, and we left Italy briefly to go to Spain, and now we're leaving Italy now to go to Flanders, uh, not Ned, but uh, in fact in Belgium. Not Ned, but in Belgium. That's a Simpsons reference. So Flemish painter, active in Bruges, 
and considered one of the best Northern European painters of the 15th century, that's the 1400s, who is often credited with inventing oil painting. Now, remember, the primary form of painting in the Italian Renaissance is fresco, which is painting in an egg-based paint on soft plaster so that the paint penetrates the wall. And when the wall hardens, the paint is deeply in there. Oil painting on canvas is a totally different thing, or oil painting on a wood panel. Uh, the paint looks different. It has a different texture. It has different uh, effects after the painting is done. It is simply a different medium, like the difference between doing pencil sketches and charcoal pastel sketches. They're different. So, Jan van Eyck, oil painting. Finally, we've got Jan Hus. Jan Hus, who is the disciple in the ideas of uh, John Wycliffe. Religious dissident who was inspired by Lollardy, which is the ideas that uh, the hierarchical church should be replaced by a much less political organization, much more pastoral, much more interested in helping people. Um, and uh, an organization that could have been dominated by the kings. Uh, that's the downside in any event. Religious dissident who is inspired by Wycliffe's Lollardy and was the inspiration for a series of eponymous peasant wars in Bohemia. Eponymous means of the same name. So Jan Hus, or John Hus, as the book says, Jan Hus, and the Husite Wars. Husite, Hus, eponymous. The same name for the wars. Uh, the Hussite Wars are some of the worst peasant uprisings in the entire Middle Ages. They happen at the end, arguably during the Renaissance, but in any case, they go on for years. They go on throughout the Czech lands of Bohemia. Lots of cities are damaged, lots of towns are destroyed, lots of people are killed between the forces of the peasants who take Lollardy as an excuse to destroy the social order and wealth, and the social order, which, like in the Albigensian Crusade, is trying to defend itself uh, against attack by outsiders. That is the conclusion of our list. For the sake of time, I am going to just briefly go over the highlights again in summation. It's worth your time. Wycliffe, religious dissident, father of Lollardy, executed by fire uh, by being burned at the stake. Leonardo Bruni, father of the uh, secular history in, in the Renaissance times, and is the first guy to use ancient, medieval, and modern as the three divisions of historical time. And he wrote about modern at the beginning of modern, actually, arguably, arguably before we even think modern history began. So he's quite the optimist. Marsilio Ficino uh, does the uh, revival of Neoplatonism and the translation of Plato's works into Latin. Johannes Gutenberg invents movable type, the printing press, and produces the Bible en masse, which is going to reform Christianity in terms of the split between Catholics and Protestants, and um, is going to make Protestantism in general much more focused on Holy Scripture than Holy Sacraments. Um, Paolo Uccello does mathematical work and work on visual perspective in art. Masaccio makes realistic figures and um, also does work on three-dimensional perspective, uh, which deals with the stuff I did up here. Uh, Baldestare Castiglione uh, does the Book of the Courtier. Vittorino de Feltri has his school at Mantua, where noble children and common children learn together equally, which is meritocracy after a fashion and it's very unusual and very laudable uh, lorenzo the magnificent de medici is the ultimate renaissance ruler ruler of florence uh, stepfather of michelangelo bonarotti petrarch is the father of humanism uh, leonardo da vinci is the ultimate renaissance man scientist artist thinker inventor and everything in between um, Isabella de Este, the Marchesa of Mantua, who rules instead of her husband and instead of her hu son during the time of her husband's absence, uh, extended absence, and her son's uh, minority when he was still growing up. Niccolo Machiavelli is a modern political thinker who looks to human nature and uh, the advantage of the prince in a very pragmatic and ruthless fashion. 
Uh, morality has nothing to do or little to do with rulership, he says. In terms of keeping power, you got to be cold-blooded, better to be feared than loved. Uh, Isabella, Queen of Castile, ends up marrying uh, Ferdinand, King of Aragon, and they form a unified country between Aragon, Spain, and Navarre, ultimately, which is called Spain. Uh, and uh, together, Isabel leads Ferdinand to second fiddle, and they drive out the Moors, drive out the Jews, and send Columbus on his journey to the Americas. Uh, pope Julius II is a warrior pope protecting the church against the kings um, and compelling Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, Giovanni Pico di Mirandola, Dea Mirandola, is uh, the person who wrote the oration on the dignity of man, the, the basic uh, manifesto of the Renaissance. Michelangelo Bonarotti is a sculptor and artist, uh, does the David, does the Sistine Chapel, does the Last Judgment. Um, Raphael de Sanzio's art was more graceful than Michelangelo's. Um, and uh, his school of Athens is famous. Uh, Jan van Eyck uh, develops uh, oil painting in and around Bruges in Flanders in Northern Europe. And Jan Hus, inspired by the Lollardy of John Wycliffe, see how we bring things back around, uh, inspires a series of eponymous wars, the Hussite Wars, which are giant bloodlettings and persuade the church even more that religious reform leads to social chaos. You should have heard all of this, understood, hopefully, all of this. And below this video, in the Google stream, there's a little place for you each to write a paragraph length or so uh, statement or question and answer, question and answer, not just a question, uh, or an observation or involve yourself in a discussion with other students about the things that we have just learned about all of these people. I look forward to seeing you, God willing, on Monday, where we will continue with the Renaissance. Also, make sure that you're signed in as being in attendance virtually. Have a great weekend.